The topic of this afternoon's conversation is, is the difference between now and summer 2019, when, when midsummer first went on. Oh my God. Not only a year of the pandemic, which has driven a truck through the performing arts, mm. but also a year of huge social and political change mm -hmm. when it comes to race, when it comes to nation, when it comes to the stories we tell mm. about our own country and other countries and how they interrelate and our heritage, mm -hmm. heritage is. And ourselves. All, and ourselves and all coalescing in one year. Which we were forced by, let's call it Mother Nature, the universe, to stop. We were, we were, we were forced to stop and pay attention. For instance, everything that happened with George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, there's nothing new there. The reason why I feel like it hit us hard is because people weren't in the flow of being consumed with their everyday lives. You looked at the news and actually paid attention because actually you were working from home anyway. You weren't rushing off to work. You weren't rushing to pick up the kids from somewhere. Given that time to pay attention has woken people up. I think it will be irresponsible to then come out of it and just go back to what you were doing before and be the same. So interesting. It's something that Tess mentioned at the head of voice spoke to us so delicately and with such vulnerability on that first day. I sobbed. We sobbed. <laughs> they all sobbed. We all, all of us sobbed. The I mean, we cried. And it was incredible because I hadn't been introduced to Nadine, like nothing, but I felt that it resounded with me. There was something incredible about, about someone saying to you, something's shifted in you during this time. And it's exactly as you say, that can't be neglected or ignored. Something changed in me, and I think I was very much an actor and then a personal life person, and I always had it all together as an actor and not as a person. Mm. And suddenly I was in this almost 12 months of just being me. And I cried the night before because I thought, oh my God, what if I slip back in to just being this consummate professional and forget all these massive lessons? Because with the social change, with the injustices and the political turmoils and all of that was reflected in me because it was just me in my house. And I needed that, I needed to not let that go. This year did matter. And the first thing that this building did was go, oh, yes, come with that. That's you, bring that in. Mm. And I did not expect that at all. <laughs> and I don't know what, I don't think I even let myself expect because I was expecting really an email going, Due to COVID-19 restrictions, the rehearsals at the Globe Theatre have been cancelled <laughs> forthwith. Same. Do you know what I mean? So I was like, don't, uh, don't dare hope, don't dare yes. dream, don't yes. dare anything. I wonder if we were a little bit muted by the practicality and the normalisation of our lives. And there's something in that, I think, of, of the whole world becoming completely abnormal. It means that everything suddenly becomes incredibly dramatic. This play is a story about everyone being intoxicated slightly and then really questioning what it is to be human and then going to the highs and lows. And to really sell it, you've got to believe that that's where humans can go. And I know that to be the case now. It's not going, okay, Christ, we've got to be really, really in love or really upset or really, actually that is the spectrum of, of human beings is as vast as Shakespeare wrote. And I think this year's taught you that that is exactly the case. Um, we're back. <laughs> we've made yeah. it, oh, we we've made are. it. Tell, tell me what's, I mean, those of you who were, who were in the 2019 production, and, and, uh, but also, you know, we, we've all, we all worked before March 2020. <laughs> we do remember dimly what it was all like. <laughs> what's changed in terms of the way, just on a practical level, the way you guys are working in the rehearsal room? Oh, tell, tell, us the, tell us the sorry tale, what do you have to do? Distance. Yeah. And how do you re how do you ensure that? I think so. What I thought was a bit maybe very naive of me was like, oh, you know, the two me thing. That's not really going to be a problem, right? Like we're all together. Like it's like really important. And it's one that what they talked about on the first day. And I think them just highlighting how important it was, and how that's a difference between us doing the show and it's not. Yes. And even if one of us do get it, we yes. can still continue. And yeah. I think having that set out from the beginning and us all being like, well, we all want to be here. We all want to do this. And it's not even just about like, I don't, I, for me personally, it's not just about like just coming to do my job. It's like, I want to be in the space. I want to be around these people. I just want to be in the room. So I think knowing that, and we're all taking the two me thing very, very seriously yeah. and the masks and 
like sanitizing our hands, which is like crazy because today we were doing a scene and I think Nanny sanitized her hand about 40,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> going from here, one second from here. But it's just like, You're doing really, Lady M. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, honestly, 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 but it's just like the distance is just so, like, to be so close but yet yeah, so far from but, someone. But how do you, so Nadia, you're playing one, you're playing Hermia, you're playing mm. one of the lovers. What? Oh my God. So luckily, I came in quite alien-y anyway because I'd been in my house for ages <laughs> and then so actually the distance didn't seem that weird and it really literally was two weeks in well a week and a half in where <laughs> the director and Lysander or Brian playing Lysander and myself went hang on a second these are lovers we'd be <laughs> snogging or something we could hold each other luckily Shakespeare's words <laughs> reach out and touch and do a lot of the feeling and the reaching but it we're meant to all be in love with each other. And today we were having a fight. I'm not allowed to touch anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and at the beginning we were like, can we use sticks or something? Like throw things, like what's happening? But yeah, it's a rock. No, exactly. <laughs> but mind because of danger. Yeah, so like, you know, it's, it's really, really tricky to establish. But actually it was, it was one particular rehearsal. Do you remember the one with, and we were just like, oh my God, no wonder it's not sitting right. Because we haven't thought about what we would do if we could. Yeah let alone what we're doing now. We just really awkwardly, like, like four metre distance apart so that we could face each other oh and, gen and then have some space to maybe encroach upon each other slightly well, more. So in fact, if you're facing each other on stage, it's, it's, it's more than two, you're, you're keeping four metres. It's just to allow for them the distance to be closed. Exactly. Because if you're, as a lover, if you're, if you're two metres apart already, you can't go you anywhere. Can't any so closer. like, you're even further away. What, what stuck out for me so much isn't, the love of the lovers, because I feel like there's fun to be played at yearning and burning desire mm -hmm. at distance. For me, it's your secrecy moments. You guys have really sort of detailed moments of, of, of plotting and, and, and secret planning and not wanting any, like, anyone to hear around you. And it's those moments of see, secretly whispering, but from over here, but like no one can hear us. <laughs> Those are the bits that stick out for me where you're just like, I really want someone to just lean in and give an ear, but yeah. you can't. You know? but in a sense, the globe, because of the globe's scale and size, actually keeping two or three metres apart from someone, from a blocking point of view, it isn't, it's, 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 it's kind of helpful, yeah. isn't it? It does serve the space to do it. And yeah. I think that's what we've had to just lean on. I and mean, then it's like eye contact suddenly becomes like sizzling. Oh, God. And it if you sense. catch someone's eye, then that, yeah, it, it is. is, it's so intimate. Mm. And, and then, and that tells its own story. And maybe it's taught us a thing or two. Mm -hmm. This will be the first time <laughs> yeah. that we've performed to a bubbled audience. Mm. The first time we've performed to audience seated in the yard. Yes. First time we've performed a substantial show without an interval. Lots of things yes. are first. And there'll be people like me being like mad keen to ask you questions <laughs> afterwards. Kind of, you know, because it does feel a bit like we're sort of going back to 96 or 97 when the Globe opened for the first time and everyone was like, well, what it's are happened. people, how will people behave? What will they do? <laughs> because those questions actually are, are kind of being asked now, aren't they? It's like, well, how will audiences respond to what we're going to do to them in, on, from May 19th? What I, what I would love to say, if we do happen to have any sort of audience members that are watching this, is I don't want the idea of being seated in the yard to now restrict and change what your etiquette of the globe was before. <laughs> I need you almost to understand that you can still be as raucous <laughs> and as unlike filtered. Yeah, and, irreverent. And yeah. Just, just live in your truest form. Don't feel like now that you're seated that you now have to be proper because we still want that that rawness <laughs> and that energy. Like people would literally be like, at you and you'd be like, yeah. <laughs> but I remember, I mean, when times were wild and we could live this way, literally mosh pit in the audience at one show. Like I, I got so into myself with my mic, but I just jumped in. It was like with these crowds of, do you remember? Like there was a crowd of like students there and I just went missing. People were like, where, where's, where's the dean? And I'm like, literally with these kids acting like I'm their age, giving it rah with my mic. And, we need to still feel that, even if yeah. you are sat down. Like, I, I want you to, I, audience members still need to feel like they can just be with us. That was the, the special bit about the show, that there wasn't in any way a fourth wall. We were just as one, mm -hmm. and I want that to stay. That's, we need to get that message to yeah, our audience. Yeah, I want that we will to do stay. That. We will do that. Uh, we, we, at the start of this conversation, we spoke a little bit about the impact of this year in, in, in all of its ways you know and it's obviously been a, a year of such 
turmoil and change and challenge and, and it's, uh, in, in lots of in lots of regards. And I guess this is a slightly sort of open and, and, and possibly too vague question, but particularly those of you who are coming back to the to the play, you know, to Midsummer. In what ways has this past year changed the way you think about the play and about maybe the messages or themes of the play? I think right. with distance being like a thing, I think the words just hit a lot differently. Yeah. I think like, <laughs> better way to word it, but I think because we can't have that touch, we're just looking into the words a lot more in depth than we did before. Not to say we didn't do it before, but I think more now than ever, the way we, the way the lovers are communicating is just so more, so much more important because we don't have that physical language anymore. And it's like what we're saying just means so much more. And it's just the way we're expressing it just like, because I can't, do you know what I mean? I can't, so I have to tell you and I have to show you but by myself. Do you know what I mean? I feel like all the characters, I think in my opinion, a lot of the female lovers, I just love in general, very dependent on each other. Maybe not just physically, I feel like now, because we have the space, they're more individual and like they're more like I am Hermia without Lysander as well. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And I am Demetrius. Oh, so, I'm Helen, yeah. and I don't. Do you know what I mean? That, sort so, of like, like I would never in a million years ask <laughs> for an, a, a positive of the past year or look at. But but it does seem to me that what you're suggesting is there are some um, new insights that are, yeah, that are possible from yeah. working in particularly restricted ways. You read ways. something like I did this. I did the play last year, and like I, the way we're reading it this year, I'm just like. Was that what was yeah. that? I don't remember this part. You know I mean? It's just like I don't remember it, but it's just like like positive and negative. And I just feel like now everything that Shakespeare has been saying for all these years, it's like we're like not for the first time, but I feel like to myself personally for the first time, like I'm really hearing you. Like I just feel like we're taking more time to just sort of just fall back in love with everything that he was saying, mm. like he's mm. been telling us for years, but mm. now we've got the time to be like, I hear you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So Titania does this speech, which is basically about climate change and sickness, and it's just like, this is weirdly parallel. You know what I mean? It's that kind of stuff and how relevant everything is. Like some things that are said like ages ago are just still like resurfacing. It's like this whole big full circle thing that's happening, which is a bit scary, but it's also like, just reminds you how relevant the stories that we're telling are. And he wrote in the, his own time of plague. Like it makes so much sense that we've been looking a lot at like the life and death and the sort of sickness. Yeah. And it all matters, it, it feels different today for a 21st century person. But now I get it, oh, you really meant that. It is life and death. There's a sense of life and death. There's a sense of how precious our time is, how important connection is. Like all of those, I feel like we've been thrust into this like strange world where all the things that matter the most, mm. everyone's made their own little list and they can be completely different and actually in individualized. You don't have to rely on the other person agreeing. Mm -hmm. Like you're so right, like Shakespeare suddenly makes sense. And it's like, mm -hmm. we've got his context, even if you're not a historian yeah. Yeah. or a literary expert, yeah. you've gone, okay. Okay, every word matters. Yeah. The parallel of what you said though about Hermia and Helena now standing on their own, yeah, regardless of these men around them, marrying you, saying that you were in lockdown and living by yourself, so had to then stand on your own, yeah. understand your emotions, listen yeah. to yourself. That can't be a coincidence mm. that as an actor, no Nadia is now a standalone that. woman mm. who has gone through this year like Xena, a force <laughs> by herself. <laughs> and it's only natural you're gonna bring that to your character, which mm. we probably didn't see before because that wasn't, the world we were from before, right? Mm, absolutely. I think that even, and I don't know whether you guys work like this already, but the social awareness, the awareness of optics, the, the awareness of our social context, socioeconomic context, like it's really profound, like political stuff. The politicalness of taking space on stage, which all of my favorite practitioners ever have mentioned to me, but it was like one of the first things that was said to us on day one. And then it also makes you interrogate the text. I feel like, as someone of so many minority demographics, you always go into a rehearsal room and think, how much of me can I bring? How troublesome am I allowed to be here? Ooh. Do I say this thing? Oh, that was, I'll just write a note for myself for later. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, but it's how, and there was an invitation here from day one of going, when Shakespeare's a bigot, he's a bigot. <laughs> Does that feel sexist to you? Mm. 
Doesn't that feel a bit queer? It's just, it is, it is what it is. <laughs> you can let it be. I think that even then, so, so many of the themes in this show, and they've given us such rain, the, us newbies, to just explore and discover. And everyone's been so, uh, so dynamic with us, bringing what we, we bring mm -hmm. and bringing their new things as well. But there's something even that of like, I can go dodgy. Felt like that was dodgy. That sounds a bit odd to me. <laughs> you know, like, like, sorry, but what's happened this year is like the whole world started to listen to us politically. And then I couldn't have been in my little room going, I'm going to go out on a demo and then come into a world where I've been said, told by the voice coach, you have a voice. I get to use it. And I think that changes plays. I think that's so it's because, you know, we've, there's been a lot of discussion this year about canon, about literature from the past, about how we engage with it. And what you've all described is, is a way of, if you like, investing Shakespeare's texts with robustness by asking questions or challenging that text. And it's not to say we pick holes in it and therefore make it unusable and discard it. No. It's to say we ask intelligent questions mm -hmm. because the text can take it and we yeah. owe it to the text mm -hmm. and the, the work we're putting on Absolutely. to ask those questions. Absolutely. I love that you feel that way, by the way. And um, I have to say that that isn't new to the new world. And that's what's amazing. And that's why I'm back here. Mm. I wouldn't, it was so important that after the year we've had, I entered back into what I do in a safe way for me. And this, this building, the love affair I have with this mm. building, the love affair I have with Sean as a director, that's why I'm back here. I remember saying it to Sean last time around, like, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna put it out here. Like you've, you've sort of, you know, you've got these five black women playing these roles that are normally like, like white men, like let's, let's put it out there. And he was kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't a purposeful thing. Like it was just, but at the same time for someone like me, it was so beautiful because it had never been my experience. Um, so I, I feel really happy in knowing that that is just how the globe rolls. And it feels like that when you get here, you feel like, oh no, no, we've got this, we've got you. And it's not an accident. The first thing you said as well, and that one of the first things that you contributed to one of the conversations, I believe it was you, but I didn't know anyone. We were all in our hoodies, like, don't talk <laughs> to me. <laughs> I've had a trauma. But did you say about the plasters? Yes. And I was like, oh my God, this building has plasters that aren't just white plasters. It was the first time, so I, I literally said that. I remember saying it kind of to lighten the mode because it was a bit heavy. <laughs> but also, at the time, it was a huge... It's massive. It's a woman. I'm a woman in my 30s, right? Like, it's, it, this shouldn't be a thing. But being at the Globe was the first time I'd cut myself during the show and someone whacked a plaster on it and I went and did the scene and I came up and looked down and I just crumbled into tears because it was a brown plaster. <laughs> it was a brown plaster, guys. The first time in my life. A woman in her mid thirties, the first time in my life that it ever even been considered that maybe we should have brown, brown pastors in the in the first aid kit. And what a story to be telling, like magic, magic, hmm. magic, magic, and one day that seems to last ages. Mm -hmm. And it's the dark. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> like it's exact. Like <laughs> we sort of circumnavigated a whole conversation about like time and chronology for the for us new because we were like we get this yeah hmm. it just it seems to be very short and very long <laughs> <laughs> like, what is time anyway it's an illusion <laughs> so that happened to us but that is this is the story it's fairies and and a group of mechanicals wanting to tell a story and people who love each other people being transformed absolutely and transformed and then it's okay that they don't change back fully <laughs> Do, do you think audiences need that level of magic and f fluid fluidness and lack of closure in some Every, senses? I think everyone understands magic. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? No matter how old you get, like, magic is magic. You don't question it. It just, why is it magic? That's it. Like, if you can get that, and I think it's just so upbeat and bright and it's just beautiful and it's just... It's just magic, right? Do you know what I mean? I, yeah. Like I, how we all feel when we come in, it's just yeah. the building itself is magic. The story we're telling is magic, so it just sort of makes sense, you know? Whether you, you've been to, you've worked at the Globe, you've not like, it's just magic and you know that. And you know what magic feels like. So when you come, it's just like, okay, makes sense. Do you know what I mean? Don't and you think yeah. that layered undertone of darkness, as you said, we get it now. <laughs> and yeah. it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to have that sort of part of us, that angle of us as humans that, We've just come from an incredibly dark time and 
We've made it through though, right? So this, yeah, you're right. This story is so, it's so connected. We, we, we speak about the magic of dream, but then the running undercurrent of it, the, 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 the being in the woods, the, the getting lost out there, Bottom's transformation, still being very much Bottom at heart, but all of a sudden he's this weird looking odd donkey. Um, and then even at the end when everything's like, and they lived happily ever after, but it's like, mm. there's, this, there's, this, there's this unspoken trauma, actually, that isn't addressed at the end, but Shakespeare has left it that other people can be like, well, you can put that in. And I feel that now. And again, embracing that and knowing that that's okay. We have come from a traumatic year. There's a lot that we don't understand about what's happened that year and how it's affected us that we still need to talk about and discover. And that's kind of where I feel like I'm at with this play. It is at the end, you're kind of like, yeah, we're all here and we're all happy, but we've come from a heavy place. And again, it's okay to be where you are at the moment. This is the guttural, human, nuanced, complex, it's nothing's hidden in this production. It's not going, can we just slide over that or oh, brush over yeah. this or let's um, not really got the time for this conversation. None of that's happening. And so I hope that the rawness that this company bring to their production means that the audience can, as you say, come and be raw. Yes. You don't have to laugh if you don't feel like laughing today because we get it. You don't have to, mm. you can sob the whole time because mm. I have on day one. <laughs> the whole, you, you know, it's, it's that invitation to humanity back in and this production does exactly that by looking at creatures and fairies. And doing you mischief in the woods. Mm. And something about this play bottles it. It's like, you know that magic? Let's explore every single way. Let's explore the magic of theatre in the mechanicals with the play within the play. Let's explore the magic of fairies. Let's explore the magic of dreaming. God, what is a dream? What is it to be awake? And how do you know that you're awake? <laughs> It's all the different layers of, ex of existence. And this play actually interrogates the whole thing. And honestly, it wasn't that profound to me when I thought it's a romp. It's one of Shakespeare's you know, most loved plays in this country. School children love it. Like, it's so accessible. It hasn't, it's not like a, you know, a King Lear or something that maybe people go, oh, is it really my cup of tea? Everyone feels there's an accessibility to it and an inclusivity to it, a democratization that's needed for these first plays back. So great, right? But then actually the play itself explores everything me as a person needs to think about right now. And I was thinking about it anyway, and then it's in Shakespeare's lines and words. And I'm like, oh, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. No, no kidding, it's William Shakespeare. But that's all, I think that's it. It's the, the unrealness. Sean, the director, has in the last week been like, right, so for Hermia, can it be sort of like this it's almost like you can't put your finger on what's happening or like you don't really know if it's real. And I was like, oh yeah, that's my life. <laughs> that's been since the theatre's closed, since we had sort of arrows in supermarkets for where you stand, since I couldn't see anyone I loved. Was it real? What is real? What is who am I? And actually our characters ask those questions. And I think there's an answer in the asking of the questions. And that's what this production gives. And I think that's going to empower every single person who comes and sees it and maybe gift a little bit of magic serum so that everyone can take that home with them or find it within themselves. And that's all we need. Thank you all three of you. Thank you Nadine and Nadi and Prime for spending time with us this afternoon. Um, I can't wait to see the show. <laughs>